good evening friends uh, i'm your host piali and i welcome you all to this webinar today i have uh, mr avinash rao with me senior director at mindtree avinash has been uh, connected to us uh, like discusses in network for quite a long time now and he has uh, presented in our conferences as well today we got a chance to be with him in this webinar and today avinash will be talking about uh, startups how they should uh, succeed how they can grow what kind of challenges they face from both the sides like from the market side from their own leadership side which all uh, startups have been embraced agile and so many things so i know avinash is already a known name in the agile community however uh, before moving forward i would request you avinash to tell something more about yourself so in case somebody is listening to you for the first time they can know more about you sure sh shall i go ahead and get started yes avinash you can start i am avinash rao i've been an agile coach i've been a kanban lean coach i had a religious experience and i Uh, switched over from agile to pure uh, pure agile to kanban and lean and uh, right now i'm in a business role and in my current role i look at how i can apply all these concepts um into a business outcome so the lens that i bring in and what i want to use in this discussion um purely in terms of structure though what we'll do is i will speak for a while and then we will open it up for question and answers because i think that's the biggest value in some of these discussions so uh, the lens that i bring in and some of you who have heard me speak before will um, i apologize in advance for repeating my story but this is one of my absolute favorite stories and i like to talk about it uh, literally all the time um, even my kid is uh, sick and tired of this particular one but i will inflict it on this audience because i think it's an important uh, view of the lens that that i bring in and it's also an important uh, view of the lens that we will apply to the specific discussion that we have on hand so if you have questions uh, we will open it up towards the end um, uh, please do note down your questions i'll be happy to answer after i finish the presentation <clears throat> So this is the story about um, from about five years ago. My daughter and I. I went to take my daughter to join Taekwondo class, and this was in London. And my daughter, who was five years old then, she said, "I'll go to Taekwondo if Daddy joins the Taekwondo class." And so I ended up being the second oldest person in the Taekwondo class, and there was just uh, me and this gentleman named Ian. So Ian was a motorcycle mechanic. He used to drive a big Thunderbird, and he had bulging biceps, a blonde ponytail, and he had tattoos all over those bulging biceps. And naturally, being the two oldest people in the room, the instructor paired me and Ian up, and uh, he said, "Avinash, well, come to you by the throat." and you have 5 minutes to free yourself and throw ian down on the ground did i mention those bulging biceps so obviously i couldn't even move ian for uh, a very painful 5 minutes and i struggled to even loosen his hold let alone move him and throw him out on the ground so after about 5 minutes the instructor took pity i'm sure it was just a couple of minutes but it felt much longer the instructor came to me and said avinash what you are in is not a hard work problem it's a technique problem even if you exercised for a year and you took steroids and did weights it is unlikely that you would be as strong as ian is so what you need to do really is pinch him under the uh, under the biceps where there are no muscles twist and trip and you know what 5 minutes later i had ian on the ground and that's what i mean by a hard work problem versus a technique problem i think too often we take everything as a hard work problem 
and we struggle mightily and we work nights and we work weekends and uh, try to win over or solve problems with hard work and what i want to leave behind with this story is that sometimes we need to apply techniques and it is not a question of hard work only one of the things with with these webinars is that there's um, a little less feedback than i would have if i was in a room full of people normally i just i get at least a couple of laughs on that one so i'm missing that a little bit but that goes with the webinar format um so we'll let's continue so i work extensively with the startup ecosystem in my current role um obviously what we want to do um, in my current role is to bring in a lot of the new ideas the energy the capabilities that startup has and um, utilize them for the work that i do and in that context i meet with and work with a lot of startups i'm also taking a startup through the lean start uh, startup journey and i'm formally coaching them as they go from being a very early stage incubation into something that um, that actually goes out for funding so in terms of the journey with the startup um th th there've been several very very rewarding interactions experiences and one particular deep dive that i'll talk about in today's session but as you can see on the slide um when piali sent the sent that invite out this is an agile series right so um the, what does that have to do with agile i'm bear with me a minute and we'll get there so in terms of maturity of processes and, and tools that's something that i've been looking at all through my career i've now been working for 18 years and in the first year when i started work with a services company i volunteered for cmm and pcmm and all those um if you're as old as i am you'll remember the war stories from those days and in those days startups was actually a byword for intense chaos and there there used to be this concept of uh, cmm level 1 and they said there were no processes it's a startup everybody comes in does what they want um and we we've gone a very great deal away from those days if you look at the maturity in terms of processes and tools um i i see that from an agile lens there is just a lot of investment and understanding that product companies especially in the startup space have put together in delivering their update there's a lot of good work that's happened on devops for continuous releases um, there are agile coaches in place um, jira the tooling the works and they also have uh, good money as i find um, often when uh, a lot of our good people leave to work in startups so that's definitely a context that we have where there is both an appreciation as well as investment towards making sure that the um, agile and the devops journey that these startups are on are well created are well documented and reasonably well followed but the interesting thing was when i looked at the process perspective everything looked completely great right but teams when i met them um monday morning they were still working 2 am uh, days and weekends but i guess that's just the that's just the whole process of startups isn't it there's just so much uh, so much happening that that happens or maybe just people um spend a lot of time with football and then they work night um that was the that was the opinion i had in the beginning of my journey with working with um startups so i said that there's been a great of good great deal of good work that has been done in startups in terms of the understanding of agile in terms of periodic delivery devops so if it's all so great why are we even having this webinar right so here comes the twist so we going into a lot of bid meetings together and we are presenting joint plans road maps um the startups present the product and the capacity investments that they are making in terms of uh, their ability and plans to deliver on product updates on the updates to the road map etc 
And while we are going through that, um, customers often come back and say, hey, Avinash, uh, dear startup, what you have is great. But what the use specific use case that we have is slightly different. We use this feature a little differently. So maybe um, if only you had a different tweak to this particular algorithm, life would have been so great and we would have been able to get it all done. And uh, the response that I nearly always get from my uh, friends in the startups is no problem. We'll have it for you next week. OK. So the next customer, they say, hey, dear Avinash, dear startup, what you have is great, but what's different? The feature that you have, it's not ABC, it's really XYZ. So the response that we give is no problem. We will have it for you next week. And then we go to the third customer, and the third customer says it's neither XYZ nor ABC. You know what? It's actually PQR. And if only you had that particular product um, week, then it would have been great fit for the work that we have. And obviously, the response that we have is no problem. We will have it for you next week. So out of these meetings, you just have this constant stream of meetings where we say, no, there is a full product roadmap that is already being uh, put through. There is a lot of uh, planning that is happening. There's a lot of investment being made in that capacity. But did we just say that we will deliver three different features to three different customers? And so that, that's uh, the other thing that normally happens with startups is that obviously the founders take a lot of the initial meetings. This is particularly uh, true when you're dealing with big logos. So there's an extreme amount of pressure on startups to do customer acquisition particularly big logos and big logos. Unfortunately, um, every one of them believe, uh, I think very mistakenly, that they are unique and things must be uh, whatever is applicable in the industry does not apply to them. There must be all kinds of changes and tweaks that must be done before it can be um, applicable and useful to a big logo. So working with a big logo obviously is rewarding in terms of the size of the work, in terms of the money, but it also means big changes. So that was the time I, I started really getting interested in the whole process, saying you've got all this agile teams and you've got a sprint backlog, um, you've got commitment on a roadmap, on the overall roadmap, and your teams in particular. So some simple solutions that uh, startups use, and I've seen all of these, um, is they actually go to some developers and they say, hey, I know you're working on this sprint, but here's something really important. It's come. It's important for us to acquire that big logo. So in addition to the work that you're doing on the sprint, why don't you pick this up? Or they go to their senior people, the architects, the leads, and say, hey, um, I know you're busy, but we want XYZ and PQR done by next week. And then you have uh, a DevOps team often that does a lot of support. So you go into them and you say, dear DevOps team, um, obviously you can pick up work, especially if they have a Kanban board. Why don't you take this up in the beginning um, and then get this done, of course, in addition to all the defects that you're fixing and the new fix pack that you are releasing. So the next customer meeting, uh, we go in and we say, so where is that new feature that we discussed last mm -hmm. week? Uh, the customer asks. And then I've, I've received a variety of these responses. And uh, they usually along the lines of, it's ready, but it's unstable. It's almost ready for demo. We can show you the flow, but some integrations are pending. Mm -hmm. And just once, um, I think somebody uh, said our developer for this feature fell ill. Now, if you step back and think about it a little bit, on the surface, it looks like these startups have a very, very well-defined methodology in order for them to be able to go in, deliver on their commitments. If you actually talk to the coach and the scrum master, they'll say, yep, we have a roadmap. We have teams that pick up all these items. 
and are delivering to those items. Mm -hmm. But then uh, when you are faced with this constant stream of commitments that are being made by the startup uh, leadership and in and in in the best interest of the company, of course, they need to grow. Um, how does that really come and impact the setup that is in place? Um, especially from an agile perspective. And like I said before, if you're as old as me, um, you start thinking of those uh, bad old days when uh, people just picked up whatever the next item was on the uh, on the agenda and try to get everything done um, in spite of having all these in place. So we started doing a deep dive into the process because obviously, and now I'm going to pick one particular example. And uh, we had made all these promises and we just couldn't uh, deliver on those. And I wasn't the only person that the startup was partnering with. So then we started thinking, if you'll remember, go back to the Taekwondo story that I uh, said in the beginning, that there must be a technique way to do this. Surely there are multiple ways in which uh, companies can sort this problem of having business opportunities which really come in. How do we resolve that in a logical way? Right? So how the first thing we thought about was how about looking at things like uh, weighted uh, shortest jobs first, right? The WSJF framework. The, the problem with taking something like that, which takes a very analytical view of what is important in terms of um, what's the time to deliver, what is the value, is that a lot of startup commitments are not driven by a logical weightage. They are driven by the desire to acquire a new business, the desire to grow, obviously. So it is very, very difficult to take a very value-based approach. Now, if a company um, CPO or a CEO has gone in into a major logo and said, we will have something ready by next week, it is very unlikely in that meeting that he's done, he or she has done a weightage of the amount of time, the amount of effort, the impact that this will have on the remaining work. Well, they, I'm, I'm sure they've used a rule of thumb. Um, in the startup ecosystem, it is very common that we go in and we make commitments to stay alive in these conversations. So we then said, can we start mapping out some of these flows of work, meaning move from an agile cadence uh, and a burn down view into a little bit of a uh, almost a flow based view of the entire work that must be done and uh, obviously if you have a given capacity you can only deliver the top priority items and uh, if you move entirely away from the original cadence into a more uh, reactive kanban style model then what happens to the regular roadmap though? Because there is already an existing commitment to deliver on the roadmap, which must be balanced with all these other items which are coming in through the leadership and through the backlog. So how do we solve that, especially from a technique perspective? So we started looking at multiple models that says, how are how is this done in other places in other problem situations so this is actually something that, that's handled by support all the time that you have swim lanes for exist regular expected work and you have an express lane for high severity defects right and for some reason i think there is a strong feeling in the industry that you have um, Kanban boards for support, and then you have uh, the regular agile burn down sprints for the development track. Uh, but given the variance and the unpredictability of the inflow uh, that you see in some of these startup uh, situations, it's very difficult to follow the regular agile cadence without being pulled apart in several directions. But is there a way to protect the advantages that that uh, agile cadence? gives 
in terms of delivering to a roadmap? And is there an opportunity to create almost an express lane for all this new, unpredictable um, or unmodeled work which is coming in? And so we move to an express lane for development in that company. And uh, the first thing to do there, of course, was to create a model of these ad hoc requests. And um, the really interesting thing is that you could almost map the amount of ad hoc requests, high priority leadership ad hoc requests to the number of uh, meetings that uh, the key leader, sales leaders in particular had from that company. It, it was almost predictable that if they were in uh, two or three such meetings, there would definitely be a certain volume of uh, changes or of updates at least demos of uh, POCs that would come in. And then what the startup did was that they separated out all these ad hoc requests into the express lane. And uh, what they did was they created a defined capacity for commitment making. And they said, we're, we're going to have all these agile teams which will continue working, uh, a slightly reduced agile capacity though. Um, so people were definitely asked to take on a little more than they did before, but they no longer have had to be pulled in or called upon suddenly to deliver on these additional requests they, because there was a particular set of people who were looking at these requests and it became, you know, it almost became a planned, unplanned change that we, we knew that there would be a certain amount of changes that would come. Meetings. Very, very interestingly, and I, I thought this was absolutely fascinating, is that the skills on the express lane and on the product development are actually very different. So on, on the product development agile teams, uh, the kind of developers um, and uh, cross-functional teams that did well there were of a different mindset and a uh, different approach from the people who did really well on the express development lane. And as part of the express development lane, uh, they had people who were almost adrenaline junkies, right? So there were lots of new things which would come in. It would be a constant challenge. Uh, they'd jump on it and value getting that done. And this actually led to a scenario where people almost self-selected uh, between being part of the uh, agile product development teams or being part of um, a flow driven, um, constantly prioritized express lane. And of course, the startup with that particular setup lived happily ever after. Uh, well, we'll see. Uh, the startup has now um, picked up momentum. They're doing well, they've got funding, etc. But this model is something which has enabled them to scale out of um, their original problems and has worked really well for them from the perspective of being able to preserve the original um, advantages of a regular cadence in delivering to their roadmap, plus being able to handle the constant stream of changes that come in in the life of any startup. So, that was my presentation today. I wanted to use about half the time for the presentation and keep about half the time for Q&A. And I can see that there are 41 people um, who are in on the session. Oh, oops, it's 42 now. So, uh, Piali, if you could open out the entire session on to the, uh, to the audience for questions. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, just uh, let me check if uh, we do have some questions. Friends, yes. uh, if you have any question, just type it on the question box and uh, Avinash can take care of those questions. Uh, we got our first question. I'm just assigning the question to you. In case you can't see the question, mm -hmm. I, I will read out for you. Okay. What approach can we take to train this express lane yes um yes so i i just want to ask zahir zarif i just want to ask zarif 
uh, what do you mean by train this express lane? Is it to train the resources on this express lane? Uh, Zarif, if you can please uh, elaborate your question on the same question. Uh, yes, resources. The resources. Okay. So um, there are two types of developers that you'll have typically on your teams. One, uh, one set who thrive on predictability and the other which will thrive on being uh, able to respond to change, who, I, who enjoy change. That is a more fundamental, almost a life skill uh, that it's difficult to train for. That is something that these people come with. Um, that's something that these people talk, um, that they bring to the table in terms of their skills. In terms of training them for that particular job, essentially, if you look at the items that come in into the express lane, the items will be in the form of demos. They will be in the form of POCs, which means that a lot of the work will revolve around customizing and branding the UI, for an ex for example, it will uh, revolve around adding in uh, certain integrations to showcase that the product can indeed uh, connect to a certain uh, data source and pull data, be able to generate results. Uh, that's something that is very common and uh, is one of the very useful sales tools that uh, startups have. So you need to identify what those specific updates sorry the specific items are which commonly occur as part of a startup sales process and you will have to train the resources in the express lane specifically on those there will be a lot of core components which typically are not touched by people in the express lane they tend to focus primarily on the UI, on the branding, on the integrations. I hope that makes sense to Zarif. Uh, yes. Uh, shall we move uh, to the next question? Sure. Yeah. So next we have how to get uh, sponsors for a startup. Um, how to get a sponsors for startup by sponsors? Uh, there, there's really two things, right? One is purely in terms of funding, and the other is in terms of mentorship. And uh, let me address both of those uh, quite quickly. Uh, the best way to look at sponsorship in terms of uh, mentorship and introductions is to in my view is to use the meetup circuit bangalore has a very very healthy and extensive meetup circuit and as part of that uh, we will be able to take advantage of uh, that circuit to be able to um, get the sponsorship and mentorship um, in terms of the funding itself i think there is um, there are quite a few avenues but Nothing beats actually pounding the pavement, making the pitches to uh, investors and to uh, venture capitalists. For the second bit, I do. I think that still remains a bit of a hard work problem. Um, if you have a, a idea that is compelling and you put it in front of enough people, there will be one who will recognize that idea for what it is and provide the sponsorship. Uh, for the mentorship, I think it is um, it, it's no longer about who you know, because you will be able to use a lot of the meetup uh, resources that we have in Bangalore. Um, and, and I think there's a couple of uh, really good ones around that. And um, it also gives you access to a community of startups and they can talk about how they have received sponsorship and funding. Okay, so uh, we have a long question here, Manasi Joshi. Uh, let, okay. Yeah, let me read out the question. First of all, she is saying thanks to me and you. Welcome, Manasi, uh, and thanks for joining us. So she is a technical writer. Mm -hmm. Her question is how documentation release-based goes off. 
uh, we work with one sprint behind but soon yes. de demand from peers is to have uh, agile documentation yes i would be, i'm i'm very alarmed if you say uh, you're working one sprint behind and i'll tell you why uh, there used to be a time in the agile world when we used to do development in sprint n and testing in sprint n n plus 1 uh, so now obviously all of us agree and accept that testing including automation testing happens in the same sprint that development happens and it's the same case with technical writing as well um, if you are a sprint behind unfortunately that means that you are a sprint behind um, on the documentation and uh, companies are moving towards getting generate uh, getting documentation that is in line with the sprint itself the core technique there um, and i uh, told you i keep obsessing about that particular uh, story so it's not again a hard work problem it's a technique problem the technique here like in the testing side is to use Um, a variation of ATDD, uh, acceptance test driven development. If you if you are a tester, you already know what your acceptance test criteria is. Similarly, if you are a technical writer, you already know what the ATDD criteria is, and you align your documentation with that ATDD criteria. If you do not use ATDD, then unfortunately. both from a testing perspective and from a, a writing perspective you will always be under stress because you do not know how much development will actually be delivered in the sprint uh, have i tested enough have i written enough so that becomes a bit of a moving target however uh, companies who have adopted atdd are able to get both automation tests as well as technical writing done in the same sprint as uh, development i hope that makes sense and next we have selish with us who is saying mm -hmm. we are a, a small startup with five resources our yes. is an enterprise web application we are developing as our product but we are okay. unable to plan releases regularly as we don't know how to plan this a lot of the structuring techniques that we use are a result of size so when the companies are really small often they need much less and for good reason they need much less formal planning processes than when they become large companies if you are a group of five people who are working together to develop it and hopefully you are all co-located as long as you are all co-located it is the amount of communication needed for all of you to be in sync and to do the right thing for your product and the company is relatively easy um your question will become a lot more relevant when your company grows because then you'll have to adopt a formal planning tool and the all five of you can't uh, sit over the lunch table and decide what the right thing is for um, a company of your size i would recommend that uh, keep it informal i think you are at the moment too small to need um, a formal planning process um the conversation over the lunch table is the best option for five people so uh, we have another question uh, once again from zarif so he mm -hmm. is asking can you give some insight or thoughts on managing the conflicts between regular team resources and express lane resources um the regular team resources and express lane resources have to be kept separate if you create a situation where there is a, a pull uh, you, we will go back to the bad old days of um, the express priorities trying to pull in and derail the regular cadence if you see a lot of that happening that probably means that the size of the express team is not large enough to handle the amount of unplanned changes that are coming in uh you should look at increasing the size of the team of uh, express resources uh in that case if it is a um, uh, zero sum game meaning that you have a fixed set of developers and they have to be divided between the two 
then um, obviously I would increase the proportion of people in the express lane. Uh, if you see constant demands coming from the express lane on the people in the regular lane. On the other hand, though, um, but you haven't asked that question as a corollary. If you have people slightly idle or underutilized on the express lane, that means that you have overstaffed the express lane relative to the work that needs to be done on the product itself. So you should reduce the width of the express lane and move uh, more into the regular uh, cadence platform development. So friends, uh, Avinash is still there with us for a few more minutes. If you have any question, please do uh, post on the question box. What I will also do is I will quickly put up my contacts and yeah. uh, please feel, yeah. feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. That's normally the best way to get in touch with me. Um, and my email ID is there as well. Yeah, that would be helpful for, for people if, if they have any query, any anything they want to connect to you. So I think we have covered all the questions. Uh, Till now, the questions we got. Okay. Yeah, that's all uh, from my side. Uh, thanks, Avinash, for your time. And uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you all for joining us. From this session, you can get one SEO and PDU. All those informations, the steps uh, related to claiming SEO and PDU, you will get uh, by tomorrow on your email. And uh, our next webinar is scheduled on 6th of March. Saket Bansal uh, will be the speaker and he will be talking about the role of a project manager. So yes, I'm hoping to see many of you in the next session as well. And thanks once again for joining. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.